Thank you, Mary. And um, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. And my university is based on the Darug people. We actually have 10 campuses, so we actually cover a number of different countries. And uh, one of my greatest things as a dean is I appointed an Indigenous lawyer to, to really look after that part. And she, uh, Linda Holden's her name, is part of Stolen Generation. So. Yeah, if there's one thing as an academic to talk about Stolen Generation, believe me, the authenticity of having a woman who not only herself was taken, but actually one of her children was falsely, by a forged adoption, out of a hospital. So, And she fought the legal case. She became a nurse and then became a lawyer and fought a case to have that corrected. So uh, really a very powerful individual and a great addition to our faculty. Could I first start, now this is a classic lawyer, with a disclaimer. The disclaimer is, although I came up with a suggestion around ethics and um, the topic originally actually of technology and ethics, etc., I do not teach ethics and I certainly would not like, want to be portrayed as any expert in that field. But I do have a genuine interest in the impact of technology through social media, both in the teaching space, to how we can be more effective and also now I'm doing quite a lot of work in the area of um, the technology and of, of legal practice in particular. And so part of my trip around the world, actually, I spent some time at Microsoft's head office in, C in Seattle. It's so just a little anecdote as a side note, but I think it's really worth showing how humans and how we behave and change. Now, Microsoft has been a fairly cutthroat environment for a long, long time. And it has shown products the bare minimum in respect of disabilities. So in other words, there are actual laws saying that certain computer programs need to have some minimum standards in terms of people with a variety of disabilities. Microsoft has never spent one penny more than it was ever required to do so, so it did the bare minimum. While I was there, they were launching new products which would help particularly people with dyslexia. It enables a normal Word document to be instantly converted color-wise, spacing, the font size, and all the things which the science now tells us really helps. So I asked the Vice President Global of Education for Microsoft why. And he simply said, our new CEO has a quadriplegic son. So all of a sudden, the technology that his which is you know, one of the world's largest companies, they can actually do something because there's a personal motivation and connection. So humans still play a major role. Now, I hope that you know, we see a whole range of products which come out of Microsoft and other companies which help that particular disadvantaged group. The other question is, if you look at the type of our, our, our suggestion, teaching ethics to future lawyers, I guess one of the questions might be, why just lawyers? I mean, to be honest, it's all people, professions, but I guess for Jolene and I, our knowledge tends to be around the education of lawyers and so, uh, and as Mary noted, my law school has a huge variety of backgrounds of people and so some of those challenges and norms occur. So I'm going to talk for about 10 more minutes or so and then Jolene's going to also talk for sort of 10 to 15 minutes and then we're going to open up for discussion. We really do want this to be a discussion and, and see where things go and there are people we know in the room who will express some opinions and thoughts and questions. I've broken my talk into three parts and I'd like to signal uh, what those three parts are and then I'll, obviously I'll expand. The first is an acknowledgement that, that ethics is a complex area and why it's complex, why we have one to two thousand years of recorded history around the teaching of ethics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Aristotle and a little bit about Amber Harrison. Now, not a usual combination, but in this case, I hopefully you see the point. I have got Barnaby Joyce, but I may leave that alone because it's too obvious to go there. But I might come, I might, what does my daughter say? Circle back to that one. We'll see. Um, the second part of my, my talk will be about you know, teaching ethics to lawyers, teaching ethics to students generally, and have a very brief tip touch on a model, which is the distinction between deontology and teleology. So we can understand that different cultures actually view ethics in different ways. Hopefully that may be useful for our understanding. And it means I get to mention Jeremy Bentham. And if I get to mention Jeremy Bentham, I can go, I went to law school with Jeremy Bentham. I didn't, because he was around, obviously, 250 years ago. But I went to the same university, Jeremy Bentham, and Margaret Thatcher, and Gandhi, 
and Nelson Mandela. So that's quite a good run of people who chose to go to the same university. The third part of my talk, is because I couldn't miss out, was around technology and how that has had a major impact in what is even acceptable, including, uh, and I now only teach in the master's program, I had a student applying to do the master's program to enroll into my course, which is, I do one called Legal Philosophy and Methodology, and one called International Corporate Governance. And it started with, hey, Mike. I've never been a Mike in my whole life. I've always been a Michael. And it's normally when you address somebody the first time, it would be quite nice to be Professor Adams, or you know, even if they don't know me. Do you know what I mean? That whole idea of that familiarity of just and then launching in without any reference. I don't know if you have the experience when my phone goes off and somebody just launches into a conversation and certainly as Dean, you know, it was like, excuse me, who am I talking to? You know, uh, give me some reference point and let's, can we back up that track and how we respond? So I'm going to develop a little bit on that with some examples. Mary, be, would you be kind enough to make sure I don't too long, because uh, I think that's important that we, we try and keep. So back to my first point, ethics, complex area. I think one of the things we need to, to distinguish, certainly in my own mind and part of this talk, is that there is a really important distinction between what I would call professional ethics and personal ethics. Now, in a perfect world, obviously, we want a perfect alignment of those things. We would expect you know, our professional people to be personally ethical. But that actually, in practice, doesn't happen. It is quite possible somebody to have a completely set of personal moral standards but professionally execute whatever they have to do in a particular way. On the professional side, I'm particularly interested in the corporation which, if for the lawyers in the room, obviously you're well aware of Salomon and Salomon Co Limited, the idea of the company in the eyes of the law is a juristic person, it's a legal person and it has a personality and we express the ethical bit as corporate social responsibility. And part of my lecture tool was actually trying to get large corporations to understand those legal duties. And within the professions, you know, the idea of the duty to the client and conflicts of interest and many of those other staple diets which are there, but can also be very technical. So yes, we comply with the letter of the regulation of the Legal Professions Act, but our heart's not really in it. We're going to try and exploit those trust accounts to give us some benefit or whatever it may be. And we sometimes contain it in little boxes so that we say these are the rules to be ethical without actually the real part. If you break down um, the corporate law duties of directors as a simple example, there were ways you need to be honest and you need to act fairly and reasonably. I mean, there's, there's actually nothing special about them, but we frame them usually because of consequences. And I certainly have come to a conclusion on this first bit of ethics in the complex area that no one religion or race actually can dominate the high moral ground of ethics or morals. And in fact, history does show that there is an impact on the systems of apply. I think we could acknowledge the common law and where it is derived from that 1066 in the UK out of an historical quirk, and then through colonisation, that many of those principles were embedded, and those legal principles actually do have some strong Judaism, Christian roots. But that doesn't mean that they're any more right or wrong than any other of the, the major religions or major um, society norms that have applied. And so I, I have a real concern. In, in the world of corporate law, as an analogy, it's really interesting that we tend to have, we being Australia, a single board. So there's a board of directors. If you look at the European model, they have a board, but they have supervisory including employees, particularly in Germany. And for a long time it was thought that the um, Anglo-American model was the only way to do business. 
and because of all the, the terrible corporate collapses and uh, some terrible behaviours by directors show that that's clearly untrue. And it was the immediate response of the European companies say, oh, but look at our model. It is far superior to then have literally five major European companies, German and Italian, all fall over for the same reasons, which is that conflict between the, the corporation, the body, and individuals. I was going to talk about Amber Harrison in, in all seriousness, um, but I might save that for one of the questions so I can get on to my other two themes. But I'd like to, uh, if we have an opportunity, dissect not the actual facts of what Chad did and what Amber Harrison did. I was genuinely fascinated by the, the media reporting, the, the, the underlying moral uh, and, and ethical issues which were arisen and the way they were reported, but also the actual judgment itself is actually quite an interesting employment ar around a covenant. Somebody signed a, a contract of confidentiality and then deciding to breach it for, for personal reasons and the consequences of that damage. And also the classic, when you start throwing stones in, in glass houses, the consequences are, are pretty huge. And I don't think there were, and if you read the judgment on the case, which is an in, in, for an injunction, um, there are no winners. I mean, Amber Harrison can't, doesn't come out very well, but certainly Channel 7 doesn't either, and, and there's you know, a lot of reputational damage. First point. Second point, teaching ethics to lawyers, in my experience, tends to be very narrow, very around the laws and regulations of teaching lawyers. That means it's about the trust account, somebody else's money, the fiduciary relationship, conflict of interest, uh, being professional and responding to correspondence and timeliness and, and, and all that sort of stuff. We don't, as a general rule, law schools tend to really extend that. And again, as we have a dean from Notre Dame, maybe in different circumstances, maybe other law schools actually do expand a little bit more, and that would be interesting to hear. Ethics to students generally in a variety of degrees, um, I've tended to use a model around, as I said, deontology and teleontology. Without, again, explaining too much detail, deontology is basically around obligations, follow the rules, somebody has set down some principles and thus there's an ethical code, usually a higher power, higher power in this context can be parliament or something of that nature, believe this to be the right thing and if you follow the rules all would be good. In our society, our general society, we tend to drift much more to teleology consequences. If we're driving through the Sydney Harbour Tunnel and we've got our, as I happen to have a nice new sports car, the roof down, in reality, by the way, don't ever have an open top sports car with the roof down going through a tunnel. It is incredibly annoying. The noise is terrible. But imagine for the sake of uh, the story. And I will drive as fast as I can. It's two lanes, it's clear, why shouldn't I? Why, why is there a need for a speed limit? But the reality is, the moment I enter the harbour tunnel, I see speed cameras, I see an 80k kilometre sign warning, and I know I'm going to get caught for speeding, so I change my behaviour. And we tend to push the limits as far as we can until there's a very clear signal and consequence. And those two concepts actually butt against each other quite greatly, I believe. The other is, in terms of teaching students, um, I think we tend to overfocus on bad outcomes. In my area of corporate, we always talk about the Ford Pinto, the car that sold millions. They knew that if you had the indicator on turning left or right, the car would explode through its fuel tank because it had this flaw in it. To replace that flaw was going to cost $3.45 US. Ford worked out that 500 people would be incinerated to death. It was cheaper to pay people to be dead than to do the recall. It was a cold, hard, and there's a movie called Class Action, which goes into how they buried all the evidence, etc. We tend to focus on that because it has all the bad elements. But what do students really learn from it? They think, oh, actually, we can get away, we can delay, we, we will rely on cost-benefit. Why don't we focus on like Johnson & Johnson when in Detroit they injected a person for personal gain into Tylenol, the, you know, the paracetamol type drug, 
And Johnson Johnson, as it happens, a Quaker-based organisation, made the decision not to just withdraw the product from the Detroit area, the whole of Michigan, and also into Chicago, and they they cast their net so much wider to protect the public because that was part of their principles. But after it was resolved, they redesigned the packaging. Have you ever wondered why, uh, when buying medications off the shelf, it all has the plastic wrapping or the on sale? All because Johnson Johnson went, we can never allow this to happen again. Compare that to our beloved Tim Tams when they were injected with cyanide on the Gold Coast and how Arnott's, who then owns uh, now Tim Tams and of course now Campbell's, the American company, they handled that scenario very differently. So, so we need to focus on those positive cases. My last comment, uh, my last minute is around technology. And I think society has been swept up in the technology. Ethics itself doesn't change. But the familiarity, the acceptance, the type of things uh, young people, gosh, I feel old now, you know, what they put up on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, forgetting that down the track they will be going for a job and somebody will check that page and it will influence potentially their decision. And just generally, the um, not that I particularly use this word, but the F word, the way it's used in society, it used to be that if the, somebody swore at the police, you know, that would be a crime and brought, now magistrate after magistrate will throw it out that the F word is such a normal part of conversation, telling a policeman to F off actually will have, is you know, no breach of the law. That's a big society change as a small example. Add in um, artificial intelligence, as already mentioned the way that uh, emails are addressed to professors, but my last example uh, is very much a technology. I'm sure everyone in the room knows about eBay. I hope everyone in the room knows the Chinese equivalent of Alibaba. I teach in China, and I was talking about a comparison to do with eBay and Alibaba in the context of resolving legal disputes. eBay actually has a very sophisticated system for trying to resolve disputes to protect their, their customers and their retailers. And I made the assumption that on Alibaba, that they would sell genuine goods. Because on eBay, you're probably aware, they have to sell the genuine goods. And if they don't, eBay basically underwrites that if it is, and I'm talking about the retailers, not the person selling, about an organisation telling, they basically have to give a warranty, an extra guarantee that that's the real thing. My daughter got caught up with a, a dodgy Apple iPhone that she thought was, brand, was real until the battery died and Apple shop opened it up and went, oh components are not really Apple components. That's how I got sort of interested. So I'm telling this story in China for Alibaba, which the, the Chinese are very proud of. On Alibaba, 90% of the goods are fraudulent. They sell fake goods, only 10%, but there would be no expectation. The whole idea, that platform, is to sell fake goods. So you're starting from a completely different mindset. So my anecdote around eBay was completely lost because they assumed eBay was exactly the same as, as Alibaba. So there's hopefully some food for thought and we can open up some other questions a bit later. Thanks, Mary.